Mm -hmm. Three, two, one. What's, What's happening, happening fandoms? fandoms? Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, we react to music videos and shows. We're back to our series of breakdowns from Will of the Pixelists for the legend of Vox Machina. This one is from episode 11 of season two. We have loved all of these. They're getting longer and longer and longer as the I know. I need to go bring my own up. popcorn sometimes. <laughs> Will put in such an extraordinary amount of work on these things. If you are not already a big fan of the Pixelists, check out the link in the doodly do below and go give them a follow. Check out their content. They do breakdowns and analysis of every episode of Campaign 3. But let's check, check out, out episode 11 breakdown right now. Welcome back to the Pixelist. I'm Will, and today we're here to talk about episode 11 of The Legend of Vox Machina season two. But before we do, let me give a special shout out to Nefer for the super thanks comment. The support is truly appreciated. Good wow, lots of good love job. from the people. Also, let me give the quick spoiler warning. If you haven't seen the original campaign, aspects of this breakdown could ruin parts of the show. That being said, if we ever dive into super spoiler territory, you know the drill, threat level midnight. If you don't want to know, just mute while that symbol's on the screen. Alrighty, y'all, we're picking up right where we left off with Scanlan and Kaylee. And if you came from my last breakdown, you would have seen the first half of this interaction from the original campaign. I will be showing you the conclusion to that after we finish this segment. But we launch with Scanlan basically going into this flashback, um, reminiscing about how he first met Kaylee's mother, or at least who he thinks to be Kaylee's mother. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of Easter eggs in this shot. First and foremost, we find ourselves in the Leaky Tap, which is the name of a tavern that we go to in campaign two, actually. Mm. Leaky Tap never shows up itself in campaign one because, mostly because it is a half a world away. It is actually on the continent of Wildmount in Zadash. So it's cool to see Scanlan, you know, this this bard who clearly has a history of being a traveling musician. Mm -hmm. It's cool to see him in places. I totally missed you know, that giant sign that said the leaky tap. tap in the original campaign. Okay. Now let's take a closer look at some of these details. First behind the bar, we have this shelf with a bunch of mugs on it. Now I think a lot of these are That's references Scanlan's to mugs mug. cast used throughout the history of critical role. Yep. Um, it doesn't seem as if there is a mug for each member of the cast. So I don't know why they would include almost everyone, but not everyone. It probably just means that some of these more generic ones aren't necessarily references. Um, but I'm still going to point out ones that I think they could be. So starting from the left, we have what I think is Travis's mug mm -hmm. from uh, early on in the campaigns. It's got a little bottle opener on the side, which I think is kind of what's being depicted there. Next to that, we have, of Pretty course, obvious. Sam's iconic mug, if mm -hmm. we can even call it that. Um, <laughs> it is. Next to that, we have a generic tankard. But as you can see here, Laura. Just a little behind the scenes, a fan made that thing for Scanlan, and it's created out of a hotel ice bucket. Holy moly. That's what's inside of it. It's oh. an ice bucket. That's how big it is. <laughs> is you know using something very similar to that um next to that we have marisha's mug with a little person attached to it um there also looks to be some sort of bird figurine behind this in the show mm -hmm. uh, i can't tell if that's just part of the cup or if it is indeed behind it uh either way i'm not entirely sure what that is but next to that we have a mug that looks a lot like one matt has used numerous times Next to that just looks like a generic like copper mug or perhaps coffee uh, cup. Um, but then next to that looks a lot like a mug Liam has used a mm. number of times. Um, and then next to that, we've got some potions and then, you know, maybe a few other miscellaneous cups there on the far end. Now, if we make our way down here, we've got a couple of kegs of ale. We've got the cold iron stout and the fire jaw ale. I think these are just kind of slight references to strong jaw ale, which of hey. course, strong, strong jaw. That's yep. exactly what it's referencing. As you've seen in the show, Grog likes to drink a lot. So one of the first kind of pieces of merch or branding they did was create Strong Jaw Ale. Um, Travis even had a little miniature keg that he had at the oh, table. Oh, that's right. I've seen that one. Which they then even iterated into this larger keg that became a prop. And they <laughs> even put out merch, Strong Jaw Ale. Um, Shirts and stuff. Would recommend. Very comfortable shirt. Not a brand deal. Yeah. 
But yeah, so I think these are kind of just slight references to that. They couldn't literally do strong jaw ale because then that would canonize his family having a brewery, which they don't. Okay, now let's make our way to this staircase here and take a closer look at this NPC that's sitting down. Now, granted, this is a reach, but hey, what are we here for, y'all? We're here for the reaches, right? Right. I think this could be Claudia Sheed. Now, who is Claudia Sheed, you might ask? Well, yeah. she is one of the owners of the Leaky Tap, and we know this thanks to Campaign 2. Now, again, Campaign 2 takes place roughly 30 years after the events of Campaign 1, and this flashback could be happening who knows when. So this is at least 30 years ago, presumably more, because this would have been before Kaylee was born. So we're probably looking at like 50-ish years ago. But she is wow. half elven. Um, more on that in a second, which means they age slowly. So she could look the same here and 50 years in the future. Hmm. But what's important about Claudia, and this isn't really spoilery, is that she is a drow that is actually just disguising herself to look like this. Mm. So with yep. um, illusion magic, she could definitely look the exact same here versus in campaign two. Now, there is no official artwork of Claudia Sheed, but there is fan art um, that I picked up from the Critical Role Wikipedia, and I'll throw that up now. And this looks a lot like her. Uh, sure she does. She does have the elven ears. She's and the got hair. The one. And here's how Matt described her in campaign two. The one leaving looks to be a uh, an elven woman, a uh, little, what would look to be the equivalent of a human 40s or so, so who knows, who knows how long her actual elven age is. Uh, but looks graceful if a lit, uh, looking a bit disheveled, hair pulled back and kind of just tied into a small kind of haphazard bun. I mean, that's basically this NPC. Mm -hmm. I don't think this really, you know, there's no depth to this. This isn't like some big reveal or anything, but I think this is just a really great, you know, <clears throat> little attention to detail and potential nod from, you know, the animators or, you know, Matt or whoever made this call. Or, you know, it's just a complete coincidence and I am a stark raving lunatic. But, you know, she's sitting on the stairs, and what does that say to me? That says boss energy. Like, yeah, this is my place. I think you're right, Will. here on the stairs Own it. talk to you. You know, that's that'd be a bit presumptuous for just a random patron to be sitting in the middle of the stairs. I don't know. I don't know. You guys tell me. I'm with you. But from here, let's move on over to these people sitting at the bar. Now... The main thing I noticed about this guy was that there is a shield and sword next to him. So clearly he is a warrior, a soldier of some sort. Again, this is another reach. Um, but in campaign two, we come to find out that the leaky tap is used as kind of a secret meeting place for the, this group known as the Knights of Requital. Again, that's 50 years, potentially, you know, more in the future from where we are right now. So is this literally a member of the Knights of Requital? You know, maybe not um, and probably not, but it still could just be a slight little nod yeah. to that. Just lore nods that, to you know, the those things that have seen the original campaigns would be familiar with. Next up in this flashback, we get a shot of this bag and the bag has the Critical Role logo on it. In addition to that, it does look a lot like the bag they gave away to Kickstarter backers back when they were originally funding this show. After this, we get the hilarious moment where Kaylee's like, that's not my mom that you're describing. <laughs> and so Scanlan launches into listing these other names trying to figure it out. And one of the names he says is Bert, Bert. Uh, which is a reference, well, to the fact that he's bisexual, if that wasn't clear oh, enough already. But it was also a reference to uh, a character persona that he used to put on in the original campaign. He would pretend to be Burt Reynolds. And ah. he basically used this bit <laughs> when he was trying to like persuade somebody or convince someone of something. Um, in addition to that, he also says the name Clara, which this is probably a reach and more of a coincidence. But Clara is the name of one of the characters in Campaign 2's Mothers. So it could be a little like, oh, you know, maybe Scanlan got busy with uh, with her back in the day. But again, probably more of a coincidence. We then get the reveal that her mother's name is actually Sybil, which is the same as it was in the original campaign. And just like there, Scanlan really doesn't remember much about her. So we don't really learn anything new and there's not really any deeper insights to glean. One other last detail in this opening sequence is the sword that Kaylee threatens Scanlan with. There is clearly some sort of magical enchantment on mm -hmm. it. And we come to find out that it is just like an immovable rod, which is an item in D&D &D that, you know, is just like it sounds. You click a button and the rod will not move. 
from where you've placed it. So they've clearly mm. combined that with the sword here, maybe for copyright reasons. Uh, and if you've seen all three episodes, you know this is going to come into play later. But yeah, in the original campaign, they didn't get this from Kaylee. Vox Machina already had an immovable rod, but this serves as a nice introduction to the item for those that yeah. weren't familiar. Also, from here, we finished this opening sequence, so I'm going to show you the rest of the clip from the original campaign. Now, if you didn't see the first half, go check out my breakdown of last episode. Now, take up your sword. <clears throat> first of all, <laughs> Kaylee, it's so wonderful to meet you. Don't try it on me. No! Listen, I have my faults, uh, for sure, but I, I didn't know that you existed. He's squirming. Who's squirming? Sam. You fault me for something that I did not know about. Do you even remember, Sybil? I mean, could you describe her a little more detail? <laughs> Yikes. Make a, uh... Oh, man. Just make a wisdom check. Just roll d20, add your wisdom out of fire. Okay. Okay. Wisdom? Which is a negative two. Uh, 16. 16. You vaguely recall Sybil. She, uh, she had golden hair, very eager to escape her simple beginnings, and very clingy very quickly. You jumped out of there very fast, Level from five. your perspective. <laughs> ah, yes, Sybil. She was passionate, <laughs> intelligent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of uh, <laughs> handsy, sort of. I mean, I think I, I remember her quite well, and she was a wonderful person. And you should be such a player to have such a wonderful person as your parent, and not someone like me, because I I was a scoundrel. You're right. You uh, are a scoundrel. I have been in past moments in my life a scoundrel I've did you even realize you nearly invited your daughter up to sleep with you <laughs> i mean I you don't like care it, i wouldn't have let let it go that far i <laughs> you have no boundaries you take what you like and you keep walking on you trick folk i draw your blade I don't want to fight you, if that's what you're insinuating. Listen, I know that I've made mistakes. In Look at Ashley. I've admitted as much before, and I don't know why I'm this way. I must need to do a lot of soul searching to come up with an answer, but there is a woman who I love very dearly and who I would do anything sure. for. I'm trying to be a better person. I haven't been to a whole house in months. <laughs> that's a big step for me. Big step. I know that's. <laughs> Look at Ashley. She's losing it. <laughs> but I've I, I've tried I've tried to be a better person. All of them are fight me, completely I'm losing going it. I'm going to be terribly disappointed because I will just let you kill me if that's what it takes. I didn't know you existed, and my heart is breaking a hundred times now for not knowing it. Every year that you've been alive is a year I could have been a better person and known someone who could have made me a better person. And Even Grog losing it. I'm only sorry that I didn't know it. If there's anything I can do for you from now on, if you are truly my blood, I will. Because among my many faults, ego is certainly one of them, and knowing no part of me makes me love you even more. <laughs> Check. Oh. With advantage for that speech. <coughs> Persuasion? Persuasion? With advantage, with advantage. It won't matter. Is there a manipulation check? Uh, 32. <laughs> 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 it won't matter. Oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. So she shit. She's big. Too. She's big. The bard. As she stands there with her blade out, kind of staring at you, you can see like the veins in her neck tensing. I slowly unbutton my shirt and show her my chest and say, stab me right here if you'd like, and I will not resist. You've earned it, take me. <laughs> you see the tear begin to roll down her cheek as her <laughs> jaw clenches. <laughs> and she thrusts forward <laughs> and rolls a natural.
natural one. A natural oh, one. A natural one. As she goes to strike towards you, even in that moment, her will falters and the blade just falls limp. It hits your chest and you feel the piercing of something uh, pushing into your flesh, but no more than maybe half an inch as there's no real force behind the blade. And as the hand releases uh, her, her weapon, it clatters to the ground as her momentum carries her arms oh. around. Oh. Sometimes the dice don't as lie. She holds her, there, her kind of tousled, you know, short pixie brown hair. Uh, you can feel the wetness across the back of your neck, and you just hear her voice trembling in your ear say, Why? Why can't I do it? All the years building up to this, and I have the chance, and I can't do it. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that you're going through this, and I'm more sorry that you're going through this by yourself. But I think deep down, you're a short halt, and there's something that you have that's connected to me, and I to you, and perhaps I misread that as some sort of ugh, icky attraction, and I apologize, but I've known for a while now that something is missing in my life, some sort of focus and some sort of moral compass, and maybe, maybe it's just arrived at my doorstep. Oh, this is quite yeah, long, her, huh? Her yeah. arms kind of tense for a minute, like an involuntary, just trying to pull you closer. Then they lax, and she steps away, kind of averting her gaze, keeping her head down. She bends down and picks up her blade. Doesn't sheathe it, just holds it limply at her side. And she begins to walk for the door. And she opens the door and looks back at you. Goes, her eyes kind of finally meeting yours, and you can see kind of the, the wet stains across her cheeks. She... You're still a scoundrel. <laughs> it's what's kept you alive this long. In some ways, it's what's kept me alive this long. I've got a lot to think about. I want to go for a walk. I need some fresh air. And she closes the door behind her. And that and is it. Sit for a moment and think about everything. Try to remember more about Sybil. <laughs> <laughs> Just a lot of a lot of faces blurring. Yeah. You worked your way through a lot of Talduri in those days. You. Uh... <laughs> yes. She was. She was. Yes. I think. Yeah. She wasn't that giant. <laughs> no. She was okay. Um, and I, uh, I, I, do, I have a very restless night thinking about everything in my room. Okay. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and take a bathroom break. Oh, yes, oh, I knew that. Oh, amazing, amazing. Oh, good. <laughs> you. Sam Oh my god. Oh. You avoided a showdown in your bedroom. A showdown. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter. Alrighty, y'all. I know that clip was a bit longer, but I had to show the whole thing. And actually, this breakdown's probably going to end up being even longer than my last breakdown because there's a few clips that are on the longer side that I really want to share. So. Thank you for being psychos like me and enjoying this. But anyway, we move on to this next scene where some of Vox Machina is still drinking. And the detail I loved here is that there's like 30 bugs in front of Pike. Now, if you didn't notice in the previous episode, she uh, you can see her in the background feeling some type of way about how Scanlan and Kaylee are yep. absconding off to the room together. So she's clearly kind of drinking her feelings away. Another little detail I like here is that Percy is drinking wine. Of which course he is. Also in season one, where it, when they were in the bar, he was drinking wine because, you know, he's too high class for just this regular old ale. Next up, we have this NPC, the same one that looks like Pipsqueak from Avatar The Last Airbender, but he also looks like a swole Matt Mercer. Like maybe he joined Jocks Machina or something. Uh, but we have him <laughs> saying, uh, you can certainly try before he gets cut off. And as I mentioned in an earlier breakdown, when Keyleth said this very same thing, that is... Uh, an iconic line from Critical Role. Next up, we have Vax being led out of the bar by a thread of fate, which yep. leads him out to the carnage of the courtyard, which is currently so many familiar faces in among the dead eyes on him. And soon, the ghosts of these lost souls begin to spring up from these bodies, and Vax runs into the Raven Queen. 
at which point all at once he is surrounded by many familiar faces. And there are actually a few different angles we get of this, so we'll cycle through and identify everybody. First of all, in this shot, we have this girl behind Vax is actually the same one from the little fishing village that we saw in season one when Vox Machina Long was ago. hunting down Brimsythe. Mm. In this next shot, we also have the little boy from that very same village. And we is that have with the green Raya, eyes? who is one of the Whitestone Rebellion members from season one. And then in this final shot, we have this Uriel. guard that could be seen in season one as part of Jarrett's troop. Of course, we have Sovereign Uriel here in the middle. And finally, we have Archibald Desne on the right. Hmm. And these souls are basically begging Vax to usher them into the beyond. And that's when he sees the Raven Queen and all of these threads of fate are pulling him closer to her. And I will touch more on this, but I'm going to wait until Vax actually goes to the temple. And before that happens, we get this scene of Vax and Scanlan having some one-on-one -on -one time. And I really appreciated this because we haven't had much one-on-one -on -one with those two. And they're great friends in the campaign, but they are even better friends. <laughs> friends in real life yep. sam and liam so i just really appreciated them taking the steps to establish this relationship a bit more and one important thing that vax takes from this is scanlan's advice to take the plunge mm -hmm. something he will mm -hmm. quite literally do here in a moment very important okay, before we head on over to the temple there's one more detail i love and i just really enjoy how they are putting in these subtle moments but when Percy is explaining his plan, going over the technical jargon, and he's kind of just lost the entire room, and they're kind of over it. Everyone except for Vex, that is, because she is slipping him this sly little smirk, and uh, I just love it. Okay, so as we move on to Vax making his way to the Temple of the Matron of Ravens, allow me to lay a little bit of groundwork. In the original campaign, this did happen, but it didn't happen at this point in the sequence of events nor did it happen at this location in Western, neither of which is a big change. Like, it doesn't even really make any difference. But in the original campaign, it happened in Vasselheim, which is the same city they were at at the beginning of this yep. season. But clearly, they just made this change to better fit the narrative for the show. Um, but a couple of interesting details here is, one, um, I love that, you know, Vax knows that he's being followed, but no, it's not Vex who is actually being successfully stealthy because, you know, she learned from the best and has been traveling with her brother her whole life. It's actually <laughs> Keyleth who is also trying to um, Follow. track them. Yeah, so that, that was, that was hilarious. But beyond that, I like that, you know, this temple is ruined because Western has been, you know, demolished by... Umbrasil and the herd over the recent weeks. Um, but when Vax initially goes inside, it looks like this pristine um, temple. And I love the details of the uh, iconography in here, all the little strings looking like the threads of fate. Yep. But at the end of this sequence, which I'm just going to jump ahead to show this really quick, you know, Vax looks back and he sees the ruined temple. So basically, he went through this vision. Like, this isn't really a fully operational temple with these priests inside this was all you know just part Up of in his head this vision i don't know if is the right word or not but experience the matron was giving him okay so now let's rewind a bit vax walks into this temple and he is immediately surrounded by these cultists that just apparate out of thin air and I'm, I'm gonna be honest the first thing for some reason that my mind went to i was like are these cultists dressed the same way that the cultists in Matt's escape room proposal were to Marisha. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a sentence. And no, they're not. But I don't know why. I just was thinking like that would be the craziest little illusion. But I don't think it's the case. But I still wanted to say it <laughs> in this video just in case <laughs> that sentence alone got people curious. And if you didn't know, yeah, check that out. Um, but so he walks up to the pool takes the plunge and yeah this is literally a pool of blood that vax has to essentially choke on and die in order to like transcend to this realm where he then will meet with the raven queen while this is happening we get this great moment between vex and keyleth where mm -hmm. keyleth is freaking out about the matron of ravens and her followers citing these weird things they like to do specifically enemas which i think is Maybe some more subliminal setup for what's going to be happening with Umbrasil at the end of this episode. <laughs> but more importantly, in this interaction, yeah. they have a heart to heart about Vax in particular. Um, and this is a moment directly inspired by a moment from the original campaign. 
Now, it didn't happen at this same time because, like I said, this temple moment is kind of being plucked from another moment in and of itself. Um, but I'm pretty sure this moment I'm about to show you is what inspired what we got here in the show. Oh, okay. So, my brother. <coughs> what's, uh, what's going on with you guys? Because I just asked him and he got really awkward. I mean, is it like for real? Is it definitely happening? Are you like in love, getting married, having babies, little druid babies? <laughs> oh, wow, you just said a lot of things in a very short amount of time. <laughs> I have a lot that I still have to do and still have to figure out, you know, mm-hmm. about my, you know, mm-hmm. myself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. So, um, do you like him? Do you love him? Just, that's an answer. You can just answer it. It's, it's not a big deal. You just say yes or no. <laughs> uh... <sighs> I'm afraid what will happen if I say yes. Okay, that's not what I asked there. I Don't think about the fear. Just think about what you're feeling. Maybe. I think that's a yes. Will you hate me if I do? No. Sure. I kind of thought you might for a very long time. You know, I thought I might as well, but here's the thing. We've been through a lot. We face death on a very regular basis. And I see the way he looks at you. And I see the way you look at him. And happiness is fleeting in this world. We don't know when it will end. Take advantage of it while you can. Stop living in fear. Maybe we're not people who are allowed happiness. That's bullshit, Kenneth. And what happens if I lose either of you? Well, you go on. Regardless of the outcome, there is a purpose. You don't think we're just destroying everything everywhere no. we go? No! Are you kidding? We saved an entire town today. More dragons may come, but for the time being, the people are safe. And we are safe. If we're successful, we could save this entire fucking world. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know they if will. I'm out to be a hero. You already are. Uh, uh, I don't know about that. Anyway. Be happy. Go to him. Just live in the moment. Don't worry about it right now. Maybe there's another time and another place where we don't have to. But now I feel like we do. We're in a mansion right now. Fucking cannonball! (laughs) (laughs) I cast breathing underwater on myself, and I just sink to the bottom of the pool. <laughs> <laughs> now we've- Is moments like that that really make a person fall in love with these people uh-huh. and their stupid characters. <laughs> yeah. It, it really, you really can't help it. They are so amazing. We've got Vax waking up to his meeting Face to face with the matron of Ravens, played by none other than the iconic voice actress, Courtney Taylor, another titan of the industry. And this shot was just breathtaking. It was just so cool to see the matron of Ravens in just full glory like this. It seems like a Final Fantasy boss or something. Uh, And just the imagery with the threads of fate and the big ring behind her. I just thought this was gorgeous. And basically what's going on here is the Raven Queen is explaining fully to Vax like what this deal that he made means. That the moment between life and death is sacred and she needs him to help shepherd these souls and protect that moment. Uh, I'm not going to go into it further than that because I am going to share the clip from the original campaign as well. And that will also cover this. Um, 
But a big thing I wanted to touch on here was the fact that she says he is fate touched. Uh, and again, she kind of explains what this means, but just to touch on it a bit more, this kind of explains why she had her eyes on him even before he made this deal. And fate touched is, is a big thing in uh, Matt's games specifically. Um, you know, it means you kind of can twirl the threads of fate around you like she mentions, but let me have Matt explain it to you when he was explaining it to a con right in the early days of Vox Machina. And he's actually talking about a fate touched in another one of his campaigns. Uh, we've run some really, really great epic sweeping storylines to the point where one of our characters, my friend Chloe plays, is a, a halfling rogue. And I'm sorry, I'm going to be talking. I'm doing that guy. I'm like, all right, here's, here's the story about my campaign, guys. Here's what happened <laughs> in the game, so bear with me. Um, her character, she discovers what's called a fate touched, which means there are certain individuals born in this world that, uh, you know, they, the threads of fate tend to just gravitate towards them. So no matter what they do in their life, their actions either, they have big impact on the world around them, or events tend to congregate around them, good or bad. You know, past this, historical conquerors have been fate touched in this universe, and she happens to be one. And so the party traveling with her in general is just a very dangerous thing, but also brings very cool things about her. So being fate touched is a really I I don't think I've ever seen that that footage. So good job, Will. A big deal in Matt's world building and his lore, and it's a concept that he's used throughout multiple campaigns in his life. So this was this was big, and it's not like this was something that Liam would have said he wanted to be when he was making Vax. He didn't, you know, come up to Matt and say, "Hey, I want Vax to be fate touched, you know, make him this really important character in the world." Of course not. This is something that Matt bestows upon you as the dungeon master. And for Critical Role, without getting lost too in the weeds, for the majority of them when they started playing um, just as friends before this ever became a Twitch stream, uh, most of them hadn't played before. Only a couple of them had. Uh, Talison, Marisha, and I think the rest might, it might have been their first time ever. Um, and a cool little moment, uh, because Marisha and Talison are familiar with Matt and his world building, and they are familiar with the concept of fate touched, check out their reaction when this is first revealed during the live stream. You are fate touched. The choice is yours. Rebirth or ruin. <laughs> so yeah, big deal. And like I said, Matt is the one that decided Liam would be Fae Touched, but it wasn't because he made that deal with the Raven Queen. That was just kind of serendipitous coincidence. Here he explains more. Follow-up question. Please. Fae Touched, always going to be a thing, or do you think that just sprang out of that moment? Uh, no. What did they uh, film that one? To be perfectly honest, I decided on the Fate Touched thing because I know you were going through some hard stuff and I wanted to give some little kind of special light to you. Wow. Oh, Matt. Wow, wow that's uh, crazy. I didn't know when it was going to come up. <laughs> oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. Oh, it's okay. It's bad down there. Under there. It's I saw spiders. The bottom Seriously. of Talison is. <laughs> is that from their first episode? Wow, that's really yeah. special. Uh, and and I, did, I didn't know when it was going to come up. Or they I, filmed I, this? I thought it might be more of like a late. So, um... They used to do a an after show, like a couple days after each episode, they would uh. have a different show where sometimes it would usually be two or three different people. They would have them in different groups. I see, I see. And then basically whoever was most important to mm -hmm. the last episode would usually be there. And uh, Brian Foster, who is Ashley Johnson's fiance, mm -hmm was the host for the show and he would ask them questions about their characters and about the, mm -hmm. the show. And like this, I think is, um, from the campaign wrap up when campaign one was completely over, mm -hmm. they decided to have a big long episode where they all got together and talked about it. Right. And this is Matt revealing some stuff about this particular thing is the mm -hmm. fate touch thing, but this was, a couple, a couple, three hours worth of Holy stuff moly. that they did. Late campaign reveal, like once things got more yeah. epic in scale and you were working with Divinity, someone would recognize and point that out and would be like, oh, but that moment made complete sense when you made that decree to the Raven Queen and sure, her being the purveyor over fate. I was like, well, this is the moment where it would come up. Yeah. This fucking game. <laughs> wow. Okay, which one of you is cutting onions? Stop that. 
Yep. Cutting Me. back to the show, we have Vax getting to see how these threads of fate connect him to all of those around him. And in this shot, we get a bunch of characters, and I'm going to go through and name them all really quick. Mostly Box Machina. There's a couple in the next shot that I'm unsure of, but we'll touch on that when we get to those. So going from left to right here, we have Gilmore, Scanlan, Cash, Zara, Allura, Vex, Percy, Kima, Pike, Grog, Keyleth, Xanror, and Cassandra. Yep, All right, so there right. were 13 characters in that last shot connected by the Threads of Fate. However, we then switched to this profile view, and there are now 15 characters connected by the Threads of Fate. And some of the characters from the first shot aren't in this shot, so there are a few new faces here. Some I'm confident on, some are a little bit up for discussion. Now, the ones I have already labeled, I'm not going to go over those again. I'm very confident in those. But for these four question marks, I'm going to start on the left side, and we'll go from there. So for the red question marks, this could be Zara. The silhouette and coat silhouette is very similar. No horns. But I don't think it is for a few reasons. Or at least horns. here's a few reasons why it might not be. Uh, one, Cash is not next to her. Two, there's no tail visible in the silhouette. And three, if we go back to the previous shot from behind Vax's perspective, then in this shot, if that is Zara, she's on the wrong side of Percy. Now, you know... Maybe it's not that deep, and this is still Zara. But if it's not Zara, then I've got two guesses, essentially. One, I think this could be Vilya, a.k.a. Keyless mother. Mm. Or it could be the twins' mother, Vax and Vex's real mom, not their, not their stepmom. Mm. Interesting. So if we move on to the next one, this kind of plays into that. I'm pretty sure this yellow check mark is Corin, aka Keyless Father, who is somebody Vax met, which may play into who these could possibly be. Um, you know, we're talking about fate and gods here. So even if Vax has never met somebody, I think they could still show up in this scene. But if we want to put the filter on it of these having to be people Vax has met, then the red question mark would probably have to be either Zara or Vax's mother. So moving on to the teal. Um, this is a 50-50. So if that is Zara in the red, I think Teal is Vax's mother. But if the red is Vax's mother, then I think Teal is Keeper Yenin. The silhouette looks a lot like Keeper could, Yenin's. Could be. Um, I mean, yeah. it's hard to tell that it's so small, but it feels like that would fit. Um, but if red is Zara, then I'm pretty sure Vax's mother is one of these, and it would have to be this one. Uh, because the Raven Queen even explicitly mentions your sister and your mother um, in the dialogue for this moment. So I would have to assume that both of those people are actually yeah. here when she's saying that. And then finally, the gray question marks. This is Sildor. I'm very confident on this one as well. Um, Vax's father. Mm. All right, y'all. Thanks to the ever-loving Everlight if you bared with me through that one. If you're still watching this video, I know you're my people. Thank you. Uh, one last thing in this scene I want to touch on is this dialogue from the Raven Queen. And let me go ahead and throw up a threat level midnight for this portion. So, you know, she essentially tells him he does not need to fear death. And I think that statement could just be taken at surface level and that would be fine. I mean, especially if she's the god of death. She's saying like, hey, just don't worry about that anymore. It's a natural part of life. It gives meaning to life. Yada, yada, yada. But I think there is the deeper potential meaning here foreshadowing the fact that Vax at some point will become a revenant, which essentially means he he's already dead. Die. Well, he will die, but he will just come back. So I think there could be the added layer of not having to fear death for that reason. RDL, now I want to share the clip of the actual campaign where Vax went through this, just so you guys can see how true they were to the spirit of the original and just because it's a really interesting moment from the original campaign. Matt does great come things. come to pay a debt. And I do so gladly and without question. What would you have of me? You came to speak with the lady? the way is before you. She gestures to the pool. Walk slow and straight in. You step into it. it. Comes up to your ankles, to your knees. 
And what catches you first is the the liquid is very thick. It is viscous in a familiar way. This is oh, they're showing it. Oh, he's showing it. Blood. Um, and it is cold. It is ice cold. As you step in, you could feel at as it begins to seep into your boots and begins to find its way into the crevices of your outfit. As you get down to your waist, it's just chilling, and you can't help but stand up straight as you step further in, not sure quite how deep it gets. And it gets deeper and deeper, out past your chest, out past your shoulders, and you're not even halfway into the center of this pool before it's going past your nose. You take your last breath, hold it, and submerge yourself in the pool. Darkness around you, the cold sensation. Nothing. 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 This this moment in the campaign is one of the like most impactful ones for me. Like I remember this. Mm -hmm very very vividly because matt mercer is a goddamn genius and <laughs> the way that he describes these things mm -hmm. and the way he sets this mood right and the pacing of his words <clears throat> it's it's masterful yeah he, he it, has he's such a visionary he is such amazing. a visionary amazing yeah As you do, you feel the blood fill your lungs, and you immediately, your lungs begin to seize with the lack of oxygen. You instinctually begin to try and reach up for the water and pool, but you can't rise. You can't get up. And at that point, the cold, piercing pain of the liquid in your lungs becomes warm. All the liquid around you becomes warm. And in the darkness, where you cannot see, you calm as suddenly your breathing is no longer difficult. It's natural. It's like air. And it's reminiscent of, of being in the womb, of the moment of birth that you've forgotten so long ago, that you're just surrounded in darkness and comfort. And piercing the center of this darkness before you, you see a very faint bead of white light just begin to spark and grow and grow, and as that light widens out, it becomes a face. A porcelain face, a nose, lips, a chin, empty dark sockets, long dark hair that goes to crimson and surrounds you. You see a small hand reach up behind and lift you from your legs. And for what you thought was only a few feet of liquid you look around you and it is an endless space, a space you've been before, a space that you once visited in your sleep, in your dreams. Mm. You look down below and you can see the infinite skein of threads that you were once given inspection to. As you look down, you see the very palm of the Raven Queen holding you aloft in this space as the mask pulls in close to you with a smile. The lips don't move, but you hear a voice from all directions in your head comforting voice, a welcoming voice. My champion, Axeldon, you've come to me at last. Wow. This was always supposed to happen, wasn't it? There is destiny, but you still guide your path where it must go. Especially you, they touched. You're one of the few that bends the threads near and around you. That's why you're so interesting to me. I give myself willingly to you for the bargain that was struck. Although I question if the bargain was just the surface reason for this to happen. She steps forward and touches the side of your face. There are those who will be frightened 
of you. But know what we do is one of the most important gifts of all. And she grabs your head, pulls down and kisses you in the forehead. Okay, one last thing to touch on during this segment, and that is, as you can see, when Vax comes out of this, he's smiling. A weight has been lifted. Uh, he kind of feels like he has a more concrete idea of what's happening to him and what his path ahead looks like. And in the original campaign, Vax was going through an existential crisis during this time in the campaign. And he was actually even flirting with the idea of starting to follow Pike's God, uh, the Everlight, as it's called in the show. Uh, but before he really got to dive into that, he, all of this stuff with the Matron of Ravens developed and, you know, he found his path that way. Um, and all around this time, uh, Vax, who is the rogue, started taking levels in Paladin. So moving forward, we might see uh, Vax do some things he hasn't done before. Next up, we get another scene of Percy trying to explain his trap and his plan to everybody. And like I mentioned in the earlier breakdown, At Dawn We Plan was the name of the episode um, prior to them going to fight Umbrasil because they spent almost the majority of the whole thing planning. And it was honestly the it's first like time Vox Machina four hours really of planning. sat down <laughs> and tried to go into a quote-unquote boss encounter with a plan. So they, they really were trying to make something happen here. And, you know, of course, Percy being the tinkerer, being uh, one of the smartest ones in the group, was the one to kind of come up with this idea. Um, so yeah, again, I just enjoyed that they uh, gave some time to this. Next up, really quick, I touched on this in my last breakdown, but we have Xanroar giving Grog his father's blood axe. And this will be one of his iconic items for the foreseeable future. I'm excited to see it in action. We got a little taste of it in these final fights. Um, but yeah, in the campaign, he also did the whole make sure it doesn't talk to me before I take it type of thing. <laughs> that was great to see. Next up, we get a really quick dose of foreshadowing as Scanlan is trying to make amends with Kaylee one last time as she is leaving, but she's not really having it. And she drops that they might be headed to Marquette, which is actually the second or third time Marquette has come up in relation to Scanlan this season. Yep. Next up, as we approach the actual trap for Umbrasil, there's this aerial shot. And one of the things I noticed was this overturned wagon as part of the terrain here, which was the basically only item on the original map during the D&D campaign. So I liked that shout out. Also, Keyleth uses Move Earth to hide everybody in the tunnels that they dug, which is kind of a blink and you miss it thing if you didn't know you were looking for it. Next up, since I've mentioned it every other time this season, I might as well hit this last one. Vex has her primeval awareness go off, which alerts her to the fact that a dragon is nearby. Next up, we've got Umbrasil landing and springing the trap. Although he doesn't do it himself, he's smart enough to notice, but Vex is able to, you know, sharpshooter and hit that chest onto the pressure plate in order to spring it and get him caught. In the original campaign, that didn't happen. He just landed and got caught immediately. But there was a glyph that um, Pike had placed that would be like an explosion if Umbrasil had moved some of like the treasure they laid out as bait. And he actually did not activate that. So a little bit of an interesting distinction from the uh, yeah. show. We didn't have the explosive trap in the show. But the fact that they kind of baited us with him noticing the trap. Um, then because he gets trapped... Um, they all lay into him, and this is kind of indicative of the surprise round of combat that they got in the original right. campaign for trapping him. In D&D, &D, a surprise round basically means everybody gets to go before the enemies get to go, so you can deal a lot of damage and really put some work in. And, you know, we've seen everybody kind of do cool stuff this season, but we do get one new move from Pike, so I'll specifically shout that out. She casts this, like, beam from the heavens, and this could be any number of things. My best guess is that it's Flame Strike, but it could be Sacred Flame, it could be Sunbeam, and it could even be Searing Light, which is an ability from Pathfinder um, that Pike had because they originally started playing Pathfinder before they transitioned to D&D 5e. Next up, we have Umbrasil turning invisible, which yeah. is terrifying. Yeah, it and is. He actually had this ability in the campaign, <clears throat> but he didn't do it during this phase of their fight. Um 
And it's actually greater invisibility, which the distinction there in D&D is if you're invisible, you can't do anything besides move, really, or else your invisibility will wear off. Greater invisibility means you can still attack and you can still do stuff while invisible. So clearly this dragon has the greater version. And it's interesting because Vex is the one to knock him out of his invisibility because this is a concentration spell, which I've explained in an earlier breakdown, so I won't yeah. retread there. But it's, interestingly, she uses her awareness to Vex find being him. the one to knock him out is pretty thematic because she had an ability called Hunter's Mark in D&D where without getting too in the weeds on it, it essentially let her do more damage to a creature and it gave her a much better chance to find said creature. Next up, we certainly get a moment of the episode where Scanlan and Vax bravely travel where no adventurer has traveled before <laughs> and give Umbrasil a personal colonoscopy. Uh, this was hilarious and this did happen in the campaign, but not in this way. So this was kind of a funny change. And the reason they changed it um, is because in the campaign, Scanlan has an ability called Dimension Door, which essentially lets him teleport a short distance. Uh, that is something that they have not played with in the show yet. So either they're going to kind of like eventually give him that ability as a power up or they just are taking that out altogether. Um but so in the show, they needed a new way to get them inside the dragon, and thus the colonoscopy was born. Yeah. Um, but interesting point of order is that they planned to teleport inside the dragon and then do the damage with the immovable rod, but in the show, sword, that we see here. Uh, but they really had no idea where they were going, so he just went for it and teleported. So they didn't teleport in the back door or anything. They just blindly teleported toward Umbrasil. And I'll show a couple of clips from this, uh, but uh, things didn't go as smoothly as they had planned. That brings us to Scanlan. Okay. Oh my God. There we go. There we go. There we go. I turn to my little buddy little and I say, are you ready for a ride, little Come man? Come on, big guy! <laughs> I, I sort of link arms with good old Vax. Actually, I, I hug him tight. Because we're gonna need me. to be tight together to do this. And I hold up my hand cone and I cast Dimension Door. And I'm gonna aim right for the belly of the beast. And I say, this is so far. <laughs> All right. I'm sure there's a check involved. Scanlan. <laughs> oh my God. You are not fully familiar with the physiology of a dragon. I no, gave I him as much information as I could. And you did. <laughs> I would like for you to make an intelligence check oh my on God. this. Just an intelligence <laughs> check. This is to your ability to ascertain, based on what you've seen, your knowledge of the dragon, where possibly in its body, its stomach may be. Okay. Why not? Advantage <laughs> because I told him where it would be? Nope. Shush, Sam. Shush. <laughs> Twelve. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can I give him my luck? <laughs> no. Don't you have to it's just intelligence, right? There's no other... Right, you add your modifier, your intelligence yeah, modifier too... to it. <laughs> Um, you would add two to that because of your bardic ability. <gasps> oh, so 14, 14. Plus, plus two to, to unskilled checks. Is, okay. is there 14, anything then. extra from Hero's Feast? No? No. no. <laughs> Just suggestions. Is there a so, touch 14. Both of you, grab hands and Hi. see what happens. <laughs> vanish. Love you, buddy. The darkness that hits your eyes upon vanishing doesn't go away. As darkness still hits you, all of a sudden you are plunged <laughs> into a thick, <laughs> wet, crushing interior. Mm. You have finished your dimension door spell. You are in darkness. You are being kind of crushed between what feels like two layers of musculature. Jesus. Both of you. Hi, dude. <laughs> you don't know where each other are. You don't see the other person. There's no oh, sight. You can't hear we anything. Yeah, they also right. Are we other? touching at all? Nope. <gasps> <laughs> Oh, the trajectory of the spell and the unfortunate circumstance and your inability to really put, put you guys between two different sides of a membrane. You don't know where you are. Oh, Jesus. It's great. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> All right. Um, is that your turn? Yeah, that's all. I, I can, I'll use my movement to go. <laughs> you are considered restrained. Click it while you're in there. Can you are both considered restrained at this point. So. Your speed becomes zero. Attack rolls have dis have against you have advantage. You have disadvantage, and you have disadvantage on dexterity saving throws. 
Uh, also, uh, you suffer eight points of acid damage, reduced to four. Awesome. All right, uh, it would be the eagle's turn, but they got dissolved. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for pointing that back out. Oh, Thank I like you. to. Well, I just want to point out that you guys held my dragon to the ground for two rounds and hit it like a goddamn pincushion. Well, which was awesome. You'll feel better <laughs> once Scanlan and I have dissolved. <laughs> I will. All right, and in Peg's turn, Vax, you're up first at the top of your round. Yeah. Cut yourself out, cut your way out. I'm just going to take the dragon blade and I'm going to as best as I can, drag it in front of me. Okay. I'm gonna cut the insides. Uh, of this first part. and foremost, yeah. you take eight points of bludgeoning damage as it is crushing you. The muscles tensing on the inside are just. Got it. Got it. He's just there, getting you're crushed by muscular, dragon right muscles. Yeah. And just being crushed. <laughs> yes. Probably it's sphincter. Now what? 17. Mm -hmm. 17. And you pull your you pull the blade and it's just unable to cut through this, this muscle and tendon. Okay. Nothing. Wait, this is what is this? Is this an attack? Yeah, it's trying from the inside. Can I cast War God's Blessing? Does War God's Blessing require you to see the creature? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. I, know. I agree yeah, with that. Probably. Probably <laughs> not. Probably not. Why would well, it? It makes an attack roll. When a creature in 30 feet makes an attack roll. Oh! So, using using the guiding bolt, you can see shifting somewhere in the body of Umbrasil. That's <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> You, you see this like form kind of moving in there, and you know, based on what you guys have discussed before. I hope you discussed this plant before. We did. We did. We discussed it <laughs> so, so thoroughly. Much. So thoroughly. Uh, the um, holy text you thread. Get, and that's a plus ten bonus. Is that what it is? Plus ten. That hits. Go ahead and roll damage. Scanlan, it is now your turn. At the top of your turn, you take amazing six points of acid damage, reduced to three, as yep. you are being. You found your way into the stomach. He did not. Um, is it big Kill in it. there? Kill it. It's fairly spacious, but it's all squeezed together right now. It's not oh. like a giant empty void. It's like a giant pocket of air in your stomach. It is Lick a- it motherfucker. Is, Oh wait, is he it? can breathe? Uh, no. no. No, you're also holding your breath. You're also submerged in current liquid that is like dissolving you. I can move my arms though. You can, you're still kind of pressed in. Okay, you can move your that's hands good, yeah. that's good. All right, I'm gonna get that rod out and click it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> in the campaign, they had a rod. In the <laughs> show, it's a sword. sword. Yes. yes! All right, so you take out the movable yes. rod and click it, and as you release it, it stays there aloft in the center. Um, you have dark vision as a gnome, correct? Fly, shithead. Yeah, shit head, yeah fly. So, you can, so you can see it there in the space. Uh, amongst the murky liquid, you can just barely see it shape there, and it is held aloft. Yes. Good. Okay, that's good. That's positive, guys. We're getting somewhere. Is that my movement? Is that my bonus? What is that? No, that's your action to pull it out. That's my whole action. And click it, because it's it's not easy to do in your sure. current circumstance sure. right now. Sure. Okay. Well, I guess that's my action. And I guess uh, as a bonus action, I can't really do anything. <laughs> uh, I can't inspire anyone because I, I don't think I can hear. Oh. Um, I'm gonna use the earring. Uh, I'm gonna use the earring to say, uh, shit, um, uh, fuck. Uh, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna just start screaming and <laughs> and say, can you hear me, uh, Vax? You guys hear through the ring. <laughs> All of the air has now escaped your lungs. <laughs> <laughs> Vax, you're up. Um, you immediately take. Tell me. Uh, eight points of bludgeoning damage. Bludgeoning. As it's condensing okay. and crushing you from the inside. All right. Um, I'm going to use my bonus action to try to... Do I, can I sneak attack this thing from inside? <laughs> I'm inside him. I'm inside him. I'll say... That's very surprising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't understand. Okay. It's different. It isn't like a soft, gooey center. All of its body is still like very dense, sinewy yeah. muscle in the vicinity. You don't know where you are in its body, so you don't know where the actual weak points are. All right. Um, so I will say, given those circumstances and your your ability to barely move, yeah, probably not. Probably not. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to use my bonus action first to hit it. It's a disadvantage. Yes. All position? attacks because you're still restrained. Okay. So that is. Um, 19, which fucks up. Uh, unfortunately, it's not cutting through. And now I'm going to use the dragon sword. Okay. Okay. Uh, How many times did they have to do it? 21. Just barely not able to cut through okay. the dense hide. The blade is caught 
Oh, it feels like a ligament or something. Uh, I don't remember. Through with your body all they're stuck in there, and they're uh, trying well, to get out. I will, for my turn, then suffocate. So yeah, things were not going well for Scanlan and Vax after they teleported inside the dragon. I'll have to tune in to next breakdown to see how that finished out. But one last little moment I want to call out in the show before we wrap things up here, and that is Grog, you know, attaching a rope to his blood axe and throwing it at Umbrasil and hitching a ride as Umbrasil flees with yeah. Vax and Scanlan still inside of him. It's basically exactly how it played off in the campaign. And there was also a cliffhanger during the original campaign, just like we got in this episode. And I'll share that clip at the end here. Um, but in the original campaign, Grog had an item called the Chain of Returning that he would often attach to his melee weapons so that he could throw them and then retrieve them since he doesn't have, you know, a cool blink back belt like Vax does with his daggers. Right. In the show, it's just a rope. So um, I guess we probably won't be seeing that item. But still cool nonetheless that they kept this moment intact. And y'all... That's going to do it for this one. You know, we Ooh. made it We made it over an hour, so we I hit the benchmark. I couldn't make it either. Not sorry. <laughs> but no, for real, if you made it this far, I know I've said this several times throughout these breakdowns, but if you've made it an hour deep with me on a 30-minute show, a 22-minute show, really, <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, such a nerd. Um, You're the man, again, Will. Again, this is my We're second to last episode this season, We're taking so in case it. this is the last time I see you, Want to hit us with the subscription? That'd be pretty cool. We Our channel has absolutely blown up. I'll, I'll save the speech for the final episode. So, you know what? We'll save it. But like, comment, subscribe. Your boy would appreciate it. We got the podcast. Check that out. Critical Role Campaign 3 content every week. And uh, once this season's over, I'm going to start making some breakdowns about other Critical Role stuff. Lore, maybe characters. Drop me a line in the comments if you got any any specific that you'd like to see in that regard and other than that y'all have a good night and he's gonna go into a dive as it does so you watch as the rod hits the edge of the body and tears through the stomach Damage. and tears Damage. through the abdomen and out the side of it the, the movable rod now Damage. shoots out the side of its body that's gonna be a lot of damage. That's right? a fucking missile. Is it? It's, it's a, a missile. missile. Well, <laughs> that is eight thousand pounds of whatever. Thirty-seven points of piercing damage okay. as it ejects Something. from the side. Um, uh, he is going to. I'm still attached to him too. Correct. Uh, as you are pulled up. Let's see here. I'm, I'm going for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> they were yeah. every once in a while they get so like tense right mm -hmm. this is one of those moments that it's not going well for them you could you could just see it on all their faces they're just like what do we do umbrasil <laughs> lifts up and goes full flying speed of 80 feet this way oh. carrying you dangling beneath uh, they have a dinosaur, I mean, dinosaur, dragon there. Up, mm -hmm. up towards Gat Shadow. <laughs> Sam and Liam are inside. Grog is hanging on. Oh, look at Ashley. Work that broom, girl. Work that broom. Yeah, look, yeah, you're right. Look at her. And that's where we're going to pick up. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was oh man matt has just this innate sense of cliffhanger perfectness for everybody yeah and um he would do that all the time you you get a sense when something is building he'll go to break or he'll break the episode um and he did it right there so just like episode 11 ends with the dragon flying away that episode of critical role ended with the dragon flying away. Mm. It was exactly the same. So, such a beautiful symmetry. All right, well, this is, like Will was saying, this is over an hour already. So if you're still with us, you're definitely a critical role person. Or a nerd. <clears throat> and both, and just like me. So thank you so much it's for all your support. <laughs> we appreciate you guys, all your likes and, and subscribing and, 
and uh, helping with the algorithm. And thank you again. And, and see, see you in the, the next, next video. video.